Good morning. I figure I should start this out with some information for you. Uh, this sermon will not be the normal length as one of Mark's would be. It'll be uh, quite shorter. You can hold your applause. <laughs> now, I don't know how much you guys know about uh, Lemoyne Christian Service Camp, but I have been out there pretty much every summer from day camp up until high teen, except for this past year due to some unfortunate circumstances. Uh, something you may not know about Lemoyne is that every summer they actually choose a different theme for each camp that they do. And a few summers back, the theme was contrast. And what that means, the definition, is the state of being strikingly different from something else in close association. Throughout the week, the focus was on how there should be a clear contrast between your life before Christ and your life with Christ. Anyway, now that I've spoiled my sermon, please open up your Bibles with me to Colossians 2, verses 12 through 14. I'll give you a second to get there, and I will be hopping around a little bit. I'll be starting in verses 13 and 14, then I'll move to verse 12, and then I'll be finishing actually with verse 20. All right, starting in verses 13 and 14, those verses read, And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. All right, let's break it down. So once we were dead and now we are alive. All of us at some point stood condemned as sinners in the eyes of God. But those of us who have been saved are no longer seen like that. For that we have Jesus to thank, because what claim would we have on eternal life without he who knew no sin taking on the sin of the world? Now that we do hold that claim, now that God has made us alive, not only are we holy and blameless in the sight of God, but as is stated in verse 13, our trespasses have been forgiven. Those trespasses, the sin of you and I, our past, no longer have a hold on us. I kind of picture sin as shackles, like chains around your wrists and your ankles, holding you down and not allowing you to go anywhere, all the while convincing you that you're just having so much fun and that it's no big deal and it's just one more time. And it gets you to believe that, you know what, these chains, they're not so bad. But sin is a liar. And the freedom felt when you submit yourself to God the only one with the power to remove your sins from you and unlock your shackles is truly indescribable. I, for one, am thankful that God is merciful and not stingy with forgiveness, rather quite the opposite. So we know that our sins are forgiven, as it says in verse 14, that our certificate of debt has been erased. But what does that really look like? When researching for this sermon, I came across an analogy that I absolutely loved and I had to include in here. So in one translation of verse 14, instead of the word erased, the phrase wiped out was actually used. And in the Greek, in the Greek form, uh, that word for wiped out is exalophane. I probably butchered that pronunciation, but oh well. Uh, this word alone embodies the mercy of God in its fullness. The substance on which uh, ancient documents were written was either papyrus or vellum, both of which were expensive and could not be wasted. Now, something to know about ancient ink is that it actually had no acid in it. So when it was written, it just lay on the paper and it didn't bite into it as modern ink would. Sometimes as a means to save paper, a scribe, uh, they would use papyrus or vellum that had actually already been written on. To do that, he would take a sponge and simply just wipe the writing away. This was possible because the ink was only on the surface of the paper, so it could be wiped away as if it had never existed. God nailed our sins to the cross with Jesus, as it says at the end of verse 14, wiping our sins away, banishing them as if they never existed. As a result of this, we are made new in Christ, having been given a life so new that it could only be described as having been raised from the dead. This is what is focused on in verse 12, which says, having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, most of you to whom I'm speaking have been saved. You've given your lives to Christ, and one day I will see you in heaven. Some of you have made that decision recently, maybe as recent as 20 minutes ago. 
and are somewhat new believers, but others of you have been saved longer than me or my parents have even been alive. Regardless of when you were born again, you were a completely different person from the moment that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, as we are told in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. So, here's a little something about me. As I entered high school, I fell in love with working out, with like lifting weights. And one thing I really love to see were those transformations, like when a really skinny kid, he starts lifting weights, and eventually, a few years later, after all that hard work, he just becomes super strong, really big. And I connected this to the idea of being made new. And I realized that our walks with God are a lot like working out. The more effort you put in, the more you read your Bible, the more you pray, the more you lean on God during times of hardship, the stronger you'll get spiritually. Your body, when you first start lifting weights, will look nothing like it does a few years down the road. Just as your faith, your heart, your lifestyle, and your actions will also take on a new form. But there's only one caveat here, and it's that you have to put the work in. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I probably don't look super strong to you, right? That's because I am a work in progress, so to speak. I am not yet as strong as I want to be, nor do I look as good as I one day hope to. Spiritually, our whole lives are spent as a work in progress. From the second we were buried and raised with him, as it says in verse 12, our new life began. And there's no specific moment where any of us can say, okay, I think I'm as strong as possible as I will ever be in my faith. My relationship with God just can't get any better. All of this I say to tell you that it's okay to be a work in progress. Don't get discouraged if you aren't where you wish you were or where you think you should be spiritually. There will always be room to grow whether you're old or whether you're young. And as Paul said in Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The final thing I'd like to get at, I know short, right, is laid, in, is laid out in verse 20, which says, If you die with the Messiah to the elemental forces of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Now, this verse kind of hits all of us at once because saved or not, we all struggle with sin in our lives. Not one of us is perfect. Romans 3.10 tells us as much. There is no one righteous, not even one. Even though we have been made new and our sins are gone with the wind, we still choose to sin. This, is, this isn't me saying that we should just try our best to never sin again because that's not realistic. We are flawed. Our flesh is against us constantly. We can seek God with all of our hearts and still fall short. Paul laments this in the famous verse where he says, For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. But you see, the point isn't to stop sinning completely. It's to, despite our sin, chase after God through it all. We won't be perfect, but when sin knocks you down, confess to God, ask for forgiveness, and get back up. That's what's important. So this verse, verse 20, it's not asking you why you aren't perfect. It's telling you to, despite your imperfections, to chase after God with all of your being. If you do that, the contrast in your life will be as clear as day. Will you pray with me? Lord, I just want to thank you for this day that you have made, a day where we've all come to put everything aside and just worship you. Thank you for everyone that's participated in this service to make it a great Youth Sunday. I pray that as we leave here, you'd watch over us, give us safe travels, and you'd guide us to do what you would have us to do and go to where you would have us to go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.